Hello, and welcome to The Comet Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm reviewing the 2012 to 2013 series of Captain Marvel, as well as the 2014 to 2015 series of Captain Marvel, because why not? Both series are written by Bitch Planet writer Kelly Sue DeConnick and are more or less one continuous story. I'm not really sure why Marvel canceled the first of these series for about four months only to restart it again back at issue number one, but sometimes comic publishers make really weird decisions, and hopefully I can help you make a little sense of this lunacy. The start of the 2012 series is the point that Carol Danvers stopped going by Miss Marvel and finally took up the name Captain Marvel. She also stopped wearing that awful swimsuit and put on a uniform more befitting a Captain Marvel. Because Carol is not the first hero in the Marvel Universe to bear the name Captain Marvel. She's not even the second. She's not even the second woman. And Captain Marvel isn't even her second superhero identity. She's also been binary and warbird. Yeah. Both Captain Marvel and Carol Danvers have a long and complicated history, and I'm not going to get into all of it here. The important background is this. The first Captain Marvel was a man named Marvel, if you can believe that name. He wasn't human, but rather Kree, a race of aliens from the planet Hala, commonly seen in the Marvel Universe, particularly in their long-standing vendetta with the Skrulls. Carol got her powers when Marvel attempted to save her from the explosion of a device called the Psyche Magnetron, if you can believe that name during a confrontation with the villain Yon rogg Hey, at least that one sounds alien. The Psyche Magnetron was a Kree-made device powerful enough to bring imaginations to life, so when it exploded around her, it merged Carol's wish to be powerful with some of Marvel's actual power, making her into a superhero of her own, Miss Marvel. If you can believe that costume. Say what you will about the main Miss Marvel costume, at least it's iconic. This first one felt like someone going, It's Captain Marvel! but sexy. It's really not, though. Thankfully, this series gives us a much better outfit designed to look like the regular Captain Marvel suit. It also comes complete with a cool helmet that gives Carol an awesome mohawk. I love punk haircuts. Not sure it seems like Carol's style, but I'm not going to complain. If you want to know more about Carol's backstory, you're in luck, because Volume 1 of the Collected Edition has a pretty comprehensive biography of Danvers, so if you really want to know, just pick it up for yourself and get the crash course in Miss Marvel history. As for me, that's all the background I'm going to cover, so let's get to the comic and take this away. The series opens with a comic that shows Carol sporting her spiffy new outfit and also making the choice to finally put Captain at the start of her name. We learn here that Carol actually achieved the rank of Colonel while in the Air Force, which actually outranks Captain, so this empowerment of changing her name from Miss to Captain is actually somewhat ironically a demotion. The art in this issue is pretty weird too, especially the coloring. The characters look kind of like zombies with their greenish pale skin and lack of pupils. And in this shot here, I was kind of wondering if this was supposed to be the scroll version of Captain America. Then an old friend slash hero of Carol's named Helen Cobb passes away, leaving Danvers her magic plane that she then proceeds to use to go on an adventure in time. No, really. She ends up in the middle of a war zone during World War II, and then later at a NASA facility in the 60s, and still later inside her own timeline as we watch a recap of how she got her powers to begin with. A young Helen Cobb that hitched a ride with Carol into this last event interferes with the timeline, giving herself superpowers instead of Danvers. Cap makes a hasty retreat back to the future, leaving Cobb out of time without trying to fix anything. For some reason, she's convinced that just getting out of there before the timeline collapses will fix everything and set it back to how it was. And it kind of does, I guess, but also it kind of doesn't. I really hate time travel. This first arc honestly feels like a lesson in feminist history, as we see several groups of perfectly reasonable and capable women do things like fight in wars and fly airplanes, despite a bunch of perfectly unreasonable men telling them that they can't because their masculinity is too threatened. Man, dudes suck. If you're worried that this is how the whole series is gonna be, first of all, wah wah. Comics are already 90% big muscular white dudes saving helpless, big-breasted, vacant-brained women from constant danger. You can suffer through one comic that isn't even the reverse of that, but just evens the field a little. Secondly, it isn't really anything that isn't historically accurate. Third, this actually is not setting the tone for the series. Most of the rest of the series is giant space battles and explosions and stuff. No, really. Before we get to that, though, Carol travels to New Orleans to help Monica Rambeau fight a giant robot. Rambeau was the first female to call herself Captain Marvel, though her powers were unrelated to Marvel's. She also appeared in Secret Wars, so she's the first Captain Marvel I ever knew about. Back in New York, Carol faces down some dinosaurs, the return of a long dead villain Deathbird, a brief but unexpected brood evasion, and, um, some lady wrestlers turned supervillains? 
Sometimes it can feel like lady heroes have to scrape the bottom of the barrel when it comes to their villains, like how the Birds of Prey's greatest villain is the man with the terrifying name of Calculator. And Carol gets to face off with the Grapplers. I think Deconic was playing for last here though, and while this comic is never as funny as, say, Mockingbird by Chelsea Kane, it does have its moments. It turns out the appearance of all these bad guys was orchestrated by a single villain deliberately messing with our hero. Deathbird and the Brood were drawn from early Miss Marvel battles, and the dinosaurs and wrestlers from items she owned. As she realizes when she returns home to find he's been there and nicely laid out the relevant stuff, including a snow globe from the Natural History Museum and these awesome grappler dolls. Man, those are great. This secret villain is the return of Jan Rog, now calling himself Magnetron, presumably after the Psyche Magnetron, which he has been collecting the shattered pieces of and absorbing into himself. It seems this whole time since Carol got her powers, he's been living and growing inside her brain, as a third lobe, using the powers of the Psyche Magnetron to bring to life imagination in order to reform himself. He's also been inside Helen Cobb's head since she was at the explosion now, too, even though she shouldn't have been because that shouldn't have happened because... Uh... I don't know, man. Time travel is confusing. Whatever the case, not Magneto uses the power of some Kree Sentinels that have been left on Earth, along with Carol's own brain, to try and reform Earth into New Hala, since the Kree have denied him the chance to return home. Carol stops him by hemorrhaging her own brain by using her powers to force that third lobe to grow and break her own brain. She survives this, but loses all memory of her past. Surprisingly, this actually makes for very little change. Aside from the occasional reminder that she doesn't remember her past, she pretty much seems to be the same person. There is then a tie-in with a story in Avengers Assemble, also written by Deconic, about a race called the Builders, who may have been the ones who essentially built the universe, hence the name, coming out of whatever plot hole they've been hiding in and beginning to lay ways to the galaxy. This story, and the end of the yon Rog arc, is actually not collected within any regular trade collections, and you can only read it in the special larger collection called Captain Marvel, Earth's Mightiest Hero, Volume 2. The plot here is pretty important for following the second series, though, so... If you're going to read both series, I'd recommend getting that collection. The main details you need to know is the Builder War leads to the formation of a galactic alliance, uniting a number of longtime enemies against a common threat. This includes the Shi'ar, the Brood, the Kree, the Scrolls, and the Spartax. The Spartax Emperor, Jason, which I'm pretty sure is actually just pronounced Jason, is a self-styled god and all-around grade-A asshole and the father of Guardian of the Galaxy member Star-Lord, although since he actually calls himself Star-Lord, maybe arrogance is a family trait. Jason at one point attempts to sell out the Alliance to the Builders in order to save his own people, establishing himself pretty solidly as a bad guy, in case you weren't familiar with the character already. The Builders also destroy Ringworld, which will be important for the second series. That series opens with Cap headed out to space with her cat, Chewie, to be a space ambassador for the Avengers. She starts out trying to help the displaced refugees on the planet Torfa, who have been falling sick from a mysterious illness. Their home planet was destroyed in the Builder War, and they were displaced to Ringworld, and then when that was destroyed, they were brought to Torfa. Yeah, things aren't really going well for them. Now, Jason is trying to pull them off of Torfa, supposedly to save them, but remember, he is the bad guy and they don't want to leave their new home. Partly this is due to the fact that the Spartax lost so many ships in the war that they can only afford to transport the healthy survivors, so the sick would have to be left to die on the planet. Turns out, Torfa is one of the few planets in the universe with a large deposit of vibranium, that ultra-rare metal that we only know of existing anywhere else in Wakanda on Earth. The Spartax used the settling of the planet to sneak some operatives down there to mine the vibranium. Turns out the mining process is what is making the people of Torfa sick, so Captain Marvel helps them fight off the Spartax after exposing their evil plot to the universe. The rest of the series mostly deals with some animal hijinks, as it turns out Carol's cat Chewie is actually a rare species called a Flurkin, which basically is an entity filled with hammer space. That is to say, it's bigger on the inside, like Mary Poppins' bag or the TARDIS, which is where it's keeping all of these eggs. Or this horrifying monster mouth thing. There's also an issue with new mutant guest star Lila Cheney, who is being forced into a marriage against her will, on a planet where everyone is forced to speak in rhyme. It's pretty great and awful at the same time. I can just envision this as a weird random musical episode of a TV show. Then Carol receives a letter from her friends back home, involving their misadventures with an angry mad scientist taking control over all the rats in New York for the cutest invasion ever. Hey, real talk here. First, rats really are actually cute. They're also really intelligent. 
Thirdly, only lab rats are white with beady red eyes. In the real world, they're all going to be brown and black and multicolored with black eyes. I was going to point this out when the same thing came up in Batwing, but I didn't, so I'm doubling up on it here, I guess. This is a pretty good point to transition to Carol's friends, because she has a pretty good supporting cast that we actually get a little too little of. There's Tracy Burke, a crotchety old woman, angry at the world and sadly dying of cancer. She's a very confrontational and angry person, especially since the love of her life, Teddy Matthews, passed away. Tracy is not an easy person to like, but despite that, DeConnick does somehow make us care for the character in her short time on the page, and when the cancer finally claims her life at the end of the series, it's actually a pretty heartbreaking moment especially since Carol was off-world at the time. There's also Carol's friends in the apartment building she lives in, particularly Marina Renner and her daughter Catherine. They both come to live with Carol when her residency changes to the Statue of Liberty. No, really. Catherine is an adorable little kid and a Kamala Khan-level fan of Captain Marvel. She clings to Carol like her sidekick and even gets the nickname of Lieutenant Trouble, which is just the greatest. When Carol loses her memories, she tries to help her remember by drawing and writing a comic book of her own that explains the history of Captain Marvel. How freaking cute is that? That about covers it for these two comics, so let's get to the breakdown. There's not really anything I particularly like about this comic, but there's absolutely nothing I actually dislike about it, except maybe some of the art. But even at its worst or weirdest, I honestly kind of like it. Mostly I think the problem is that Carol just isn't that interesting of a character, and Marvel's space opera stuff is just too weird and complicated and steeped in Silver Age mythology to really appeal much to me. Despite that, I don't regret reading any of this and even found myself enjoying it at times. This is probably due to DeConnick managing to take these boring things and mix them into a compelling enough story to keep you reading. So all of that is basically why I'm giving these two series a collective 6 out of 10. If you're a fan of the character, for whatever reason, it's definitely worth checking out this series. If you're not, I don't think anything here is going to change your mind. Hey everybody and thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video going over the history of Captain Marvel, which I did for the release of the movie, which is also coming out today. If you saw the movie, let me know in the comments what you thought of it and how it compares to this history. That's all for now, and I hope to see you again next time, right here in the Comic Cave.